Welcome friends once again to this final day of the three day event we have had in Mount Laurel, New Jersey. There are so many people who are following different masters because ultimately the teaching of all masters is the same. If it's a true teaching, how can it be different? And a true teaching is very simple. It says the truth, the reality. If you want to find it, you will find it within yourself, not outside. You can try as hard as you like, you can go to all the pilgrimages you like. If you want to find the truth, you have to go within yourself. That simple thing, and they also say, you can have try any method of going within. They also tell us that there are several stages to which you can reach in your pursuit of inner knowledge and inner reality. There are stages where you can find how the energies of this body work together. They sustain this body and they sustain your experience of the universe. The universe is a creation from yourself. Therefore, what is inside your body controls everything, including your experience of a universe outside. They tell us that this body of ours is a wonderful, the most wonderful thing ever made in the human body. It contains so much, not only information, not only systems of work, system that can work, but it contains centers, like ganglions of centers, where from you can contact any level of consciousness. That's amazing that within this body should lie a system of centers, certain nucleus. By putting attention on those nuclei, you are able to have any experience of any kind. And those are 18 such centers in the human body. Most people don't have don't know anything about 18 centers. Most yogis talk of six chakras. Some say seventh chakra, crown chakra. And they talk of the energies that can be found in the human body by going to the six chakras below the eyes. Those six centers are all energy centers. They control all the energies that control our life and control our relationship with the universe. But they do not give you higher awareness of any other universe. The center that give you awareness of other universes lie behind the eyes and above the eyes, above the head. Only in this little section of the human body. The eyes are the cutting point. The eyes divide the lower part of the body into those centers which cover energy and those centers, 12 centers behind the eyes control awareness, higher awareness. The 12 centers, they control the astral plane, the causal plane, the spiritual plane and our true home. They contain everything. They divide into small sections. These control the six separate types of energies. This is, this body has been described as Pinda. Pinda means physical body. The Pinda is what is controlling the six energy centers and is below the eyes. The Anda, which really means the end, the origin. The origin of all this lies behind the eyes. And these centers go right into the center of the head. As we meditate, trying to focus our attention, trying to put our attention to trying to put ourselves Behind the eyes, we are able to open up those centers and have the experience of the highest levels of awareness. We don't leave the body, we become unaware of it. It is the successive steps of unawareness of the outer covers that opens up the inner covers. Our attention is piercing through these three covers. The cover of the mind, the cover of the sense perceptions and the cover of the physical body. They divide our experience into these layers. The layer of Binda, Anga, Brahman. These three layers create all our experiences in time and space. The universal mind which creates all these experiences operates through these three different channels, through these three covers. It is like wearing one costume over another costume to do different acts and to have different experiences. So when we are able to withdraw our attention, which as I explained yesterday and day before, is like dying while living. That means you do the same process of withdrawing your attention and consciousness from the extremities of your body to your head, like when you die. When you die, that's how your awareness is pulled up. Ultimately, you are able to speak when you are unaware of where your hands and feet are. 
Similarly, you are able to speak when it, you are just pulling out on it also. When you come up here, you are not able to speak. When you go here, when the brain is dead, the head is dead, the life has gone out, you are dead. Here, in meditational practice, in a simulated death, dying while living, you don't die. You keep the body intact. You merely go and touch those different centers. And by touching those centers, you become unaware of this body. You become unaware subsequently of your sense perception. You become unaware of your mind and open up and discover who you are as a soul, as a spirit. Spirituality arises from the spirit. The spirit lies beyond the mind. And perfect living masters come here and tell us to take, take us to the spiritual place. They say, the truth lies in the spiritual planes and not in the three covers of the mind, senses and the physical body. But all this is available to us while we are still in the physical body. And that's the beauty of this body. That we have this arrangement already built into this body in a human body. This arrangement does not exist in any other form of life. This arrangement of being able to access these centers of higher awareness does not exist anywhere. The discriminating mind, the mind that can differentiate things, the mind that makes choices, the mind that experiences free will does not occur in any other species. Out of the 8.4 billion species recorded in Indian literature, none of them have this ability except one, the human form. It's amazing. The human form should be so singularly different, should be so unique that they have this capacity to touch those centers of awareness and get to know who they are. This ability has been placed in us as an arrangement made by our own self as our own totality, in our own reality. That when we get tired of these experiences we are having, with these covers on, we should be able to go back. I mentioned the other day about a movie somebody recommended to me to see. I don't see many movies because I cry in them, as you know. But this movie I didn't cry, not too much. It was called Inception. In that movie, they show how you can go into a dream, then dream within a dream, and then a dream within the second dream, and a third dream. I noticed some beautiful things in that movie. One was the change of the nature of time when you go into a sleep state and a dream state. A ten minutes of wakeful state in a dream can become an hour. In a deeper dream can be a lifetime. In 1962-63, I first time came to this country. In those days, this was a big subject to study. Sleep, dream. A lot of people were interested in interpreting dreams. What do they mean? Where do they come from? A subject that has become interesting again now. And there is a group of scientists examining whether dreamland is a reality somewhere. And we actually go there. Or is it just merely created from our subconscious by picking up some old elements? Because some of the experiences people have in dreams are not relatable to their life here at all. That is why they are examining whether dreams have something more. And this is not currently under examination. But in 62-63, they used to have sleep clinics and sleep labs where they would put subjects to sleep and allow them to dream. And they put electrodes on them, they put cameras on them, they would see rapid eye movements being recorded. And they could always know now the person is in deep sleep, now the person is dreaming, just because looking at the eyes, and the rapid eye movement, they also noticed that when the eyes move vertically like this, that means they are seeing something vertical. They would wake up the subject in the middle of the night after they see the uh, eye, eyelids moving like this. And they would say, what were you dreaming? Oh, I was seeing a waterfall. It was a beautiful waterfall. Water was coming down. As if internally he was looking up and down. And they were being reflected in the physical body by the movement of his eyelids. Somebody's eyelids were moving like this in a horizontal direction, and you would be woken up. What were you seeing? I was seeing a tennis match. A tennis match, board from here and there. So the dream sequences that were taking place were to some extent being reflected on the physical body also. But the person seeing the tennis match and the person seeing the waterfall was totally aware that he was the same self who woke up, but he was not aware of his physical body. He lost awareness of his physical body but he was still the same person, same self. 
The self never changes, no matter what you are seeing, in what state you are, whether dreaming, awake, in the higher level of consciousness, or in your true home, in totality. The self continues to be the same. That is why the self is the only permanent reality. If you want to find permanent reality, find the self. Now, when they were doing these experiments with sleep, they found that a person with seven minutes of sleep could narrate things that happened in two hours. In one unique case, which I still remember, one person had a sleep dream sequence in which he felt he was a little child going to school and he felt he grew up. He met a girl there and he fell in love. He married that girl. He had children. He became old. He was doing, doing some work. He retired. When he was a grandfather, he woke up. The sequence lasted seven minutes. He lived his whole life in seven minutes. So there is a now, there is a scientific explanation for that, why that happens, and there is a metaphysical explanation. The scientific explanation is that when you have these experiences, you are not living through your whole life, you are living through flashes. Flash after flash comes, and those flashes just took seven minutes. You can gather enough flashes in seven minutes to have a whole life. When you see the scientific explanation of a dream, then you begin to understand the scientific explanation of this world also, this life also. These are also flashes. These are also still flashes, like I mentioned yesterday, they are like a projector and projecting an image outside. These flashes are put together. They are single flashes. When they go together, they make a light. How long do they take? How long does it take to make the whole flash? No time at all. When you put it into time, you can expand it. And here you can make it seven minutes. In a dream, you can make it a whole lifetime. In that movie, Inception, they show that ten minutes of sleep create one hour of experience. In this second dream, it makes it even longer. Third dream, it makes a lifetime. In the lifetime sequence, they find an old man sitting, a wise man. And he's asked by these people who are recent entries into the dream state, they ask him, are these people sleeping here? All these people come to sleep in order to wake up? He says, no. They come here to sleep because if they wake up, they have no time for experience. They come to sleep and have a long life. I understood this exactly what we are doing. We are here extending our life because we want to have a longer experience and we are sleeping. So when we wake up, we go to a higher level of consciousness, ultimately go to a timeless state. The pattern was very similar. But the more important thing I noticed in that movie Inception was that they had a means to wake up. If in the middle of the dream, if, uh, if a catastrophe was taking place, they could wake up. And how they did it was that before they went to sleep, they kept a little totem in their hand, which had a little pointed point. So that when they pressed that, it would cause a little pain and they would wake up. So since the eyelids are also moving when you go to sleep. They made arrangements that the totem in the hand will also move, will press in a catastrophe. It's a sleeping body. So when they had a catastrophic, a catastrophic uh, experience in the dream, the hand would move and you take up in the pain. They would move from the third dream to the second to the first just by that totem. I said, how wonderful. We have done the same thing, except instead of three dreams, we have six dreams, six dreams going on here. We have come to the sixth level in dreaming, and we are still carrying the totem with us. What is the totem? Totem we are carrying, which we ourselves held in our hand before we went to sleep. The totem is called a perfect living master. It's just an appearance in our life, a human being who comes and awakens us, and we made that arrangement ourselves. He is the totem. What does he do? What does he do? What is his role? He has not come to change the world. He has not come to change anything. He has come to wake us up. For which the arrangement we had made, that when we are tired of this experience, when we have had, had enough of it, we should be able to wake up. And this is the arrangement we made, a very good arrangement, that in the projected world, which we are projecting, there should be a peace in the projected world, with which we hold on and wake up. A perfect living master is an ordinary human being, just like us. There is no difference. The difference is only in his awareness. 
and we have placed that awareness in him so that he can awaken us. It's the self doing the whole thing. We have only one self. The one self is created by many and the many are using this process of being awakened by another human being. Another human being who is like us. Great master used to say, if you have a large number of radio sets placed together and they are not connected to the power source, you can't get the news from any of them. If one gets connected to the power source, they give you news of the world. He used to compare a perfect living master with the radio set that's connected to the power source. A perfect living master is connected with the source, connected with his true home at all times. Not at some time and now he has come to teach us. No. He is connected at all times. And therefore, he comes here with that awareness and can take us to that awareness himself. His job is to take us home if you are tired. That is why these perfect living masters come here with the sole purpose. I am saying sole purpose of taking their marked sheep back to home. The marked sheep or those sheep the shepherd has come to collect belong to his nest for which he has come because they are ready for him. They are ready because they have been seeking. When the seeking takes you at a point when you are ready, a master appears in your life and takes you back home. That's a simple thing. Of course, those who are marked to be taken home by a particular master, master will come in their life no matter what, no matter where they are. By coincidences, series of coincidences in life, circumstances will happen that a master will come in front of them and they'll recognize by the pure, unconditional love they'll experience from such a man. He'll be an ordinary man, but his love will be extraordinary because it will be unconditional. There will be no judgment involved at all. He will never judge anybody. He will not say, I love you because you are good or bad. He will say, I love you because you are a marked soul. I've come to take you. He will not look into your karma. He will look into your seeking. Look into how earnest is your seeking. That's the basis on which he will pick you up. And when he comes and takes you, he fulfills his obligation. That's what he is here for. By the way, when he comes and appears in a physical world like this, many others will also see him. Many others will follow him. Many others will have his version. Such a person with that kind of awareness with him, his version can make other people mark. His version can make other people also mark. But it does not mean necessarily they are marked by him, to be taken by him. But they are marked to be taken by somebody. So that is why when such a person comes, he comes with a list. I call it in my terminology, list A. List A is those he will take back home because they are marked by in his list to be taken home in the same light in which he meets them. Then the others who get this version, get his benefit of his presence, they are marked into list B and a particular master will come to them, if not in this life, in the next life or still future life. Some of these people who get initiated by the master may also be on this B because they have not reached that point in their seeking, but they have come across, they have come into a point where they were ready to be put on a list, a, a second list, in which they will not stay here for more than four lives. The maximum they will be here four lives and they will be taken back by some professional master. It does not mean they have to wait four lives. This four life business has bothered some people. I remember first time I came to this country, and Sanji said, you know, we hope we will have only two, three more lives. I said, how are you sure this is your first out of the four lives? This may be the fourth one. Why are you always waiting for three more lifetimes? That is like procrastination. That's like putting off things. So I told them a story, a true story, that once great master was giving a discourse. In that discourse, he said, any person who is initiated by a perfect baby master will not have to come into this world in this human form more than four times, including the time in which he is initiated, three more lives. My father was not present. He was, a, he was an initiate and disciple of that master. He was not present at that discourse, at that satsang. He heard from other people that this happened. He came late. In the evening, he met that master. 
And he said, Master, I have told you, mentioned in the morning, that a person initiated by the perfect living master will not have more than four lives. And that master said, Lake Raj, that was the name of my father. Lake Raj, why are you worried? This is your last life. Why are you worried about it? He said, no, I am not asking you because of last life. I am saying, supposing I want more than four. Are you putting a restriction on me? Then great master laughed and he said, this four life is not meant for everybody. Those who are initiated by a perfect living master and follow his instructions, they will go the same life. Those who cannot follow the instructions and have to make up for it in a second life, they will go in the second life. Only those who leave the path, they leave the master, ever get a chance to come in a third life. And those who are, are almost against the master, even crucify the master, even kill the master, they come in the fourth life. So don't think that it's a rule for everybody that you will come in four lives. If you follow the master's instructions, that is your last life. That was a great thing. Of course, we were very lucky to have Arun Maharaj Baba Sawan Singh. Some of us who were lucky to be initiated by him. Because later on we found out how he became a master. And that's another story I will share with you. It's a very interesting story. It's recorded by one of the disciples of that master who, who and a friend of his, very close friends, and the friend was a disciple of Baba Jamal Singh, the same master who he hated Baba Sawan Singh. He was present when Baba Jamal Singh asked Baba Sawan Singh, the great master, to take on the job of being a master. Now, Baba Jamal Singh was a military man, a simple man. He served in the army and he was not asking too many questions. He found a master, he accepted, he was happy. Baba Sawan Singh was a clever man. He was not like him. He worked in the government service. He worked in the engineering service. And you have to be very astute to be an engineer. And he had many questions to ask. He asked several questions. So there were 14 people present. I'm telling you a historical fact today. Not many people will know it. There were 14 people present, including one Narayan Singh, who told the story. Narayan Singh said that we were 14 of us sitting. Then Baba Jamal Singh said, I have got the hukum, I have got the order from Kwamini, my master, Savan Singh, you will be the next master and carry out this work. And Baba Savan Singh folded his hand and said, Master, why me? I have not done that much work like these other people. They are more advanced, I know they have done more meditation, more advanced. I have been working hard on my engineering job, why me? And Baba Jamal Singh said, wait, let me check. So he closed his eyes and he was for a few minutes closed his eyes. He opened his eyes and said, New Moj has come. New will has come. Playful will has come. Moj means the playful will has come. My master says, No, tell Savan Singh, he will be the master. He said, But master, I have problem. Baba Savan Singh said, I have some problem. What is your problem? He said, the problem is, I am a poor man, I am working in government, I am not a business tycoon or somebody, I have a very small pension. And you mean to say that this work will increase and so many people will come? How will I feed them? How will I feed and accommodate so many people? That's beyond me. And Baba Jabal Singh said, wait, let me check that out. Close his eyes. And he opened his eyes and said, new boy has come. And Baba Sawan says, what is the boy now? He says, the boy now is that my master says, Sawan Singh should not worry because people will bring enough money and food to serve everybody. He will never have to worry about it. That he has to arrange money for feeding those people. Therefore, he says, you should carry on. Baba Sawan Singh says, wait, I have another problem. He says, what is your problem now? He says, Master, I have been accustomed to living in a nice house provided by government. I live in a nice bungalow. You are living in this little hut. <laughs> you mean to say I should leave all that, come and live in this little hut in the Dera, in River Bias? 
just to carry on this work. Mama travels and looks at him and says, wait, let me check it out. <laughs> he closed his eyes and after a while he opened his eyes, new boss has come. He said, what is the boss now? He says, my master says that Saul says will not have to live in this hut. He will have a house better than the house he will be living in as an engineer. So everybody, all the 40 people were surprised at the questioning after they were going on. And Baba Savans, he still did not stop there. He said, Master, I have another problem. He said, what is your problem now, Savansi? He said, Master, you say that once initiated by a perfect living master, a person can come for four lives. That means I will also have to come four, four times to save them. I am tired of one life, I want to go back home, you want to tie me down to four lives? He said, wait, let me check that out. <laughs> so he closed his eyes again and after a while he opened his eyes, he says, new Moj has come. He said, what is the Moj now? The Moj is Saval saying, my master says, whoever you will initiate will not come in a second life, but go back in the same life. Okay, master, I will do your work. Clever master, don't you think so? I think he was the cleverest master called the greatest master. So the great master got all three conditions filled up and before he started on this. So we were very lucky. The few people that we were able to get initiated, we know that he worked on this basis. He worked on the basis that when he initiated anybody, that was the last life. He could hold some people at the astral plane at the causal plane, at different stages, but not come back into the physical world. When we say four lives, four lives means after that you don't come into this physical world, which is a world of mixed pain and pleasure, of pairs of opposites, and you are at a better position to keep on meditating, keep on fulfilling your karma. Incidentally, karma is created only in the human form through the experience of free will, paid off either in human form or in any of the 8.4 species, billion species that exist, including living in the astral and causal plane, including dreams. Karma can be paid off. The karma when you create is called a karam juni. That means a life in which you can create karma. The one where you can pay off is called bhog juni, which means now you can clear off your account. We create so much karma with our intention, with our thoughts, all the time, that the creation of our karma is a very small slice of existence in a human life, and the payoff is a very large spectrum of life, both on the physical plane and astral and causal plane. So what the masters do is that they take the rest of your pranap karma, which you created now, to be fulfilled in the astral and causal planes and take you back home. The sentient karma I spoke of yesterday, the reserve karma, is totally destroyed and burnt at the time of initiation itself. An initiation by a perfect living master destroys the reserve karma, changes your attitude, which is very difficult to change otherwise. Attitude keeps on persisting because it is based upon accumulated karma for all lifetimes, not merely one life. Whereas incidents of life, the events of life are created by problem or destiny based upon incidents of previous lives. But the attitudes towards things, which is called sanskar, the sanskar are built over all our lifetimes of the past. They are accumulated. So the sanchit karma, which is an accumulation of all previous lives' karma, determines our sanskar. And at the time of initiation by a perfect living master, those sanskars are changed and the his sentient karma is destroyed. So therefore, when a initiate of a perfect living master comes in the second life, the only elements from which the second life is built is the element of one this life. Otherwise, if this does not happen, we form our life not from one past life, from several past lives. Little elements are taken from different past lives and they come and form our current life. In one of the epics of Mahabharata of India, a blind kid asks the master, Master, you have permitted me to look into my past life. 
I have looked into 100 past lives. I have never done anything to become blind. How come you say that past actions create your current condition? And Master said, look back further. 104 lives back, you tortured a person, took out his eyes. And that has come out to play out in this life. It was held back in all these lives because of some other good things you were doing, but it came up now in this life and made you blind. When we say, how is our destiny made up? A destiny is not made up from one previous life. A destiny is made up from several lives. But when the several lives, their karma, reserved in a sense, if karma is destroyed at initiation, the only life available to make the next life's karma is this life's problem which you are putting to in the current man that you create now. That's all that creates the next life. That is always better. Always more conducive to meditation and working further on the spiritual path. Always better to make further progress on the spiritual path. So that is why once one is initiated by a perfect living master, that's the end of the game. According to Guru Granth Sahib, the sixth scripture, it says, this darshan sadhur paya tiska lekha nibadeya. One who has seen the darshan of a perfect living master, his account is finished. Because thereafter, the account of any living moments after that, whether in this life or other, are in the control of the master. Not of a negative power that runs this world. Not of a time, space, continuance power that continu continues to keep us here from cause and effect, but it is taken over by the master. That person is initiated. No angels of death come at the time of death. The master himself appears. The master himself appears and takes our souls to where the master thinks is appropriate. According to the karmic pattern, the master determines. Whenever an initiate dies, only master will appear as a death, nobody else. No negative power comes. And that's a very big, very big thing. I have seen so many people initiated by great masters passing away. In fact, most of them, over my colleagues, have passed away. And I've seen, I've been at the deathbed of some of them. And each one of them told me, Master, now come, I'm happy to go. Including my own mother. In fact, my mother once called me, I was in the United States, and she said, Master came. I said, okay. Hi, goodbye. Then after a while, she calls again, the Master said, not yet. <laughs> I said, Master just came to give you darshan, why have you got it? Of course, Master has passed away in 1948, in a recent event. So, next time she called, she said, Master has come, I am going. I said, okay, goodbye. And she left. I was very happy. By uh, my dad, who was also initiated, great master told him, I am telling you my family, a situation which I came across. He was a great disciple. He was a professor of philosophy and taught metaphysics in college. And he used to ask questions from metaphysics, especially about free will. If, if God knows everything, that means God knows what we are going to decide, then how can we have free will? Questions like these, which are very difficult questions. So he used to be an English professor from England teaching in India. He had no answers. So one day somebody told him, you want to get to a real professor, go to the river Vyas, near the Dera, and Baba, Baba Shavan Singh is a real professor. He came to him for the same question, so he had the right answer. He went back into college and told all his colleagues, all the professors, he found the answers. And many of them became disciples of the great master. The great master told him that he was a tree in his last life. He says, if I was a tree, he said, I've always felt wooden. To catch my head. To catch my head, I always feel good. So I must have been a tree. He said, You are a tree, but a perfect living master sat under the tree, took a little twig from the tree, and used it as a toothbrush. That was good enough to make you skip over any other kind of life and become a human being. Now you have come, and now you have to catch up with all the missing links that you left behind. And his faith was. Tremendous. He used to think great master is God in human form. He totally believed. There is nobody else. He is in the total. And we just happen to see him in human form. He would come home and tell my mother, just come up to see God. She said, what do you mean? You mean the master? 
Yes. Why do you call him God? Call him Master. He is not God. He is teaching us how to meet God. No, he is God in human form. My mother got very irked with these kind of answers. Very angry. She went to Great Mom. She said, Master, I have a complaint. Great Master said, what is your complaint, Kako? Kako was an affectionate term for ladies. And she said, my husband has turned crazy. He thinks you are God. And comes home and after meeting you, he says, I just met God. Why doesn't he know that you are a master? He said with a smile, Kaku, don't mind what he says. He's just saying out of affection. He's saying out of respect. He's saying out of love. When somebody says out of love, we just respect it. Just ignore what he says. So that's how the matter was settled. I was working in the government. I was chief secretary of the state at that time when my father passed on. He died. I had already fixed a meeting to go to a meeting in New Delhi where my father was and we were supposed to leave at 3 o'clock in the morning. A few minutes before 3, when I was about to get into the car, I got news from my sister that our dad had just passed away. I said, that's a good opportunity for me to check out where did he go after 3 to a human being. Maybe my uncle used to say he has done so much meditation. He's a meditation with Siddhar Bhada Jagat Singh, with the Pankar Paul Singh, with so many people, who then is of Sangis, for hours and hours. So he might have gone somewhere high. One of my uncles say he might have reached Tekuti, the Corbel plane. So I said, now he's gone. He's not going to come back, I know. So good time to check out. So while the car was driving, I was in meditation, trying to talk to my master. I said, Master, out of curiosity. I just want to know. Not only know, I want to see. I want to see my dad. Where is he now? And great master told me, you can't see him. I said, why? He says, instantly at the time of his death, he merged in me and in such kind. I said, master, did he do that much meditation? He said, no. But his love and devotion and faith was perfect. Thereby telling what takes us to such Khan instantly is not meditation, but love and devotion and perfect faith, unshakable faith. I knew he had that. That's how I learned a big lesson. Meditation is for the mind. Love and devotion and faith that comes from love and devotion, the unshakable faith. Faith that believes he's God and human beings, human flesh, that takes you to such Khan. So I've always emphasized how important this is that you have love and devotion for the Master. That will take you higher. Not only because of this experience that love and devotion takes you that far, but because love and devotion comes from beyond the mind. Whereas everything else comes from within the mind, including all types of meditation, including all types of repetition of words, listening to sounds, everything is all within the mental realm. You don't have any time and space to hear something, don't have time and space to see something. It's a unique experience beyond the mind, which the mind cannot understand. We sitting try to understand with the mind cannot never understand. That's why they make stories about what it is. It's indescribable. But you can reach there. Reach there now. You can reach there while you have human bodies here. Because the centers which can give you access to that kind of experience are still within us while we are living here. So what a wonderful opportunity that we are able to have these experiences while they are still here. I have been sharing these views with you for these three days and many of you are already initiates of Masters. Many of you are already meditating. My tips are very simple. One, do not meditate mechanically. Do not start meditation unless you have become conscious that you are not the body, but you are in the body. You become conscious that you are a living force behind the eyes, inside your head. Place yourself in the head first. As I have been teaching in the meditation session we have had in the last two days, place yourself there, then start meditation. Do not merely close your eyes and start. It doesn't work. First place yourself there, and then start. 
Do not meditate without love and devotion expressed for your master. Do not routinely repeat Simran or any mantra in your head without having conversation with your master. Master is a living being. The living being is living in you. You have seen him outside and you will see him inside. It's not a concept. He's not some, somebody living far away unseen. He is not in the Tibetan mountains. He is not living anywhere else. He is living inside you. And if you stay long enough behind the eyes, do nothing else, stay long enough behind the eyes, he will appear. If he doesn't appear, call upon him to appear. Have a conversation. If you want to cry before him, cry inside, not outside. Meditation will be successful. Therefore, start from there and do not forget love and devotion. I'm very happy I could spend some time with you. I know there are a number of people who are waiting for interviews and there are a few questions that I would like to answer. So I'll take a few minutes now. I think uh, Jonathan has questions uh, still written up. I'll take up a few of them. Do you have a few questions? We have lots of questions. Okay. I'll take some of them. Beloved Baba Ji, is Baba Sawan Singh Ji coming back to the physical plane? Is Baba Sawan Singh Ji coming back to the physical plane? Why should he come? If he is merged in Sat Purush, he will become one with the ultimate. Every master who comes will be the same Baba Sawan Singh, coming from the same source. Don't you see, when you become totality consciousness, you become one. You are not separate. You are no longer Baba Sawan Singh. You are no longer anybody with an individual name. These names are given to our bodies. They are not even our astral names. They are not even our causal names. They are certainly no names. In such hand, when you go there, you become one with the totality of consciousness. You become Satpurush. Satpurush is one. And Satpurush can come in any form. So every master who comes back, every great master who comes back, every perfect living master who comes back is Baba Sawan Singh. I have a quest for spirituality, but being a young man, I also have a quest for the opposite sex. Is that a problem for my spiritual growth? What does one do about it? I have a quest for spirituality. But being a young man, I also have a quest for the opposite sex. Is that a problem for my spiritual growth? <clears throat> As it happens, we all own facts. Folks have also been young men, including me. And we all have the same problem. So it's not unique. In fact, it's one of the most significant problems. Sex is a natural function of the human body. It's a function that's been placed in us for the production. It's a function without which the, the whole population will not grow. The species won't grow. No species will grow. It's a natural function provided to human beings and to all other species of life. It's not something unnatural. Therefore, it's a natural activity that will happen. Now, when you say, will it come in your way, it depends upon how you look at it. If you look at it as something that's a temptation and something that's dragging you out, it will come in, in like any other distraction. It will come in your way. If you take it as a natural activity, which is natural to human being, it will not be a distraction. It all depends on how you take these things in stride and not only sex. It's also all other activities of life. People have asked me, I go to my job and I have to put my attention there. Is it a distraction in meditation and in my spiritual life? My answer is, if when you are doing your job, you are thinking of master and it's master job, an opportunity given by your master, it's as good as meditation. These are not my words, but the giving master's words. His own grandson, younger brother of Maharaj Charan Singh, who became a successor to two, uh, uh, two stages later, Prashotam Singh, he joined the uh, army and became a lieutenant colonel. No, he became a lieutenant, lieutenant, lieutenant in the army and he was posted at a camp. He came back to his grandfather, the great master. He said, Master, all my life I thought I will be serving you and sitting at your feet. And what have you done? You put me out in the army, so far away from you. I am going to resign and come back and do service to you. 
great master said, go back to your unit and go back and serve there. If you serve there with dignity and saying, this is master's work, he told me to serve there, it's as good as meditation, it's as good as serving me. These are his words. We don't give up these things in the world just because we think that distraction and meditation is something separate. Meditation is not separate from your life. Your entire life should be meditation. Everything you do should be with the thought of your master and with thought of spirituality and become spiritual and become meditation. These relationships here that we have, sexual relationships, other relationships, they are created by our karmas. They are created, we meet people because of our past actions and past lives. They are natural reactions. It's a natural law of karma that's creating these things. We have to go through them. You should take them as something that you are acting in a role, in a, in a play. And you are actors. That's not your reality. Your body is not your reality. Your body is an actor acting here. And whatever you are doing here is an act according to a play. Put your attention within. Remember the master. Even if you are having sex, remember the master. Therefore, don't think that the activities of this life of any kind are supposed to be taking you away from the spiritual path. You can do all your work of any kind, anywhere, and so long as you think you are doing it as master's work, it's like meditation. So don't be worried about these things. If most of us come back by a reincarnation, then why is the world population increasing? Where are extra human beings coming from? And why don't enlightened souls such as yourself help scientific progress by astral travels to different worlds or by time travels to upcoming future? If most of us come back, there are two questions, I'll separate them. If most of us come back via reincarnation, then why is the world population increasing? Where are extra human beings coming from? Human forms are only one form of life. There are several other forms. As the forms progress through evolution, not only Darwin's evolution, which says the species evolved from monkeys, from, from insects and from amoeba, not only Darwin's evolution, spiritual evolution, which follows very closely Darwin's method, that when a human being dies, because of his karma, he can be an insect, a bird, a mammal, and again become a human being. Lord Krishna, who is worshipped in India as a avatar or Vishnu, he is giving a discourse. As a child, to his childhood friend Udo, they were both cowherds. They used to take care of the cows of the village. And they take them out and graze them and take them back home. While they are out, Krishna was enlightened at a very early age. And he tells Udo, he says, Udo, with his words in that dialect of that, of that part of the country, the dialect spoken in the Uttar Pradesh area, where this dialect took place, the words used by Krishna were, Udo karma ki gat nyari se. That means the nature of karma is very strange. The great translation. The nature of karma is very strange. And he explains later what he means. And he says that karma can never be atoned by whatever you do afterwards. You cannot cancel karma by good deed. Therefore, you do one bad deed and one good deed to atone for it. You are punished for the bad deed and rewarded for the good deed. That's how we get caught up forever here. If we could atone for our karma, we could get away. But you cannot atone. And then he, after explaining that, he points out, look at this ant crawling. And he shows points to an ant crawling. He says, this ant at one time was Brahma, the creator of this universe. This ant was one Indra the Lord of one of the heavens in the astral plane. And today, because of his karma, he is an ant. Even reaching that state of awareness, they were still bound by the law of karma and they can become ants. This transition from one form of life is continuously taking place. So when we say, where are these other 
Human beings coming from as increasingly population of the world, they are coming from other forms of life evolving into human life at this time. If someone is to be initiated, was the master always with them or only at the time of initiation? If someone is to be initiated, is the master always with him or only at the time of initiation? Once a master initiates, once a perfect living master initiates a human being, he is with him, with that human being, that disciple forever. From that moment onwards, forever. No matter what the form of the disciple takes. No matter whether he is here in the astral plane, other plane, an angel, in heavens, the master is with them. Never leaves. This is a permanent friendship of which I have not seen the like of anywhere in the universe. The friendship of a perfect living master with a disciple is such, there is no comparison. It's permanent, eternal. And the best part, the love that you experience from that friend who is a master is always unconditional and non-judgmental. So that's why it's the best friendship. So, as soon as the master initiates a person, he manifests himself inside that person and stays there forever, accessible to that person at all times, day and night, 24-7. Dear Master, what are your thoughts on astrology? Any truth to it? What about palmistry? What are your thoughts on astrology? Astrology is a science, a very old science. I studied, like many other studies I did, astrology was one of them. Studied with a very great astrologer who was a Satsangi, a great master, follower of the great master. And he held a class in the era to teach astrology. We learned how to draw the charts. We drew the planetary positions. We could see aspecting of the planets and we could study them. And he was very good. For example, he was able to predict why great master was alive. That after this master dies, whose chart showed that he can die whenever he likes. There are some charts like that also. At least I know of two or three people who charts say they can die whenever they like. Great master's chart said that. The, the, con, con, the confluence of the star was such that it gives all the power to the man who holds a particular pattern. But after he dies, when he chooses to die, the next master who follows him in this era will be their master only for two and a half years. And he predicted this while great master was alive. Great master, after that, appointed a man to be a master. His name was Siddhar Bhagat Singh, attorney. An attorney who received Julian Johnson for the first time when he arrived in Jalanda Station and took him to the era. That attorney was very close to great master. Everybody knew he loved great master. He was the only person who had 24-7 access to great master to come at any time and master would receive him. He named him in a will, sitting in the lousy when master was ill. He named him to be the successor. After a few years, Bhagat Singh died. Great master recovered. People had great doubts about the great master. Didn't he know that he's naming somebody who died? And he said he will be a master. Something went wrong. The astrologer was asked. He said, I didn't name him. Great master named him. I only saw the charts and I said, the man who comes after him will be their master only for two and a half years. This man never came after him, so I am not bothered about him. When great master died, at the era, one professor, Sardar Bhadar Jagat Singh, was named as his professor and took the era of him. Took the duties of the master at the era. He died two and a half years later. Astrologer was right. So, after seeing these things, after my own studies, I do believe astrology has something to it. Now, astrology base, bases itself on planetary positions and where the planets are in the zodiac, where they are moving. When you want to see a scientific ex explanation for this, the truth is that the planets are not controlling what's happening to you. What's happening to you is karmic, but the planets seem to be at the same place according to your karma. The cause is the life that you have. Planets happen to be the effect, not that they are the cause of our, what is happening here. We take it the other way around. As if the planets are going to decide what our life will be, they don't decide. Our karma decides 
and the karma is fitted in in such a way in our experience of the universe, in our experience of the star, that the stars take that position. Therefore, it should be, it would be wrong to think that the planets are affecting us. It would be correct to say that from the planets we can read what our life would be. This is something different. So astrology is based upon that. Any truth? Yes, the truth is as I have described. That they don't create our destiny. We, our karma creates destiny. But the karma is placed in our lives at which the in the planetary positions is in certain form. And most of the time you can read it. What about palmistry? I practice palmistry also. I farmed off a lot of people. <laughs> and the truth is, there have been some very nice astrologers also. I saw some a very good astrologer in India. He was known for predicting if a pregnant woman will give birth to a boy or a girl. Everybody consulted. Every woman who was pregnant said, consult him. I want a boy. Is he going to give me a boy or a girl? Somehow boys were preferred over girls for some reason in their society. And therefore, they all wanted him to come and tell. He was very clever. He would always predict that you will have a boy. They would give him lots of sweets and a lot of money for giving good predictions. After making the prediction, he would go to the neighbor's house and tell the neighbor, I did not want to hurt their feelings. The truth is, that pregnant lady is going to give birth to a girl. Now, if a boy is born, the all celebrated, he got more money and more sweets. If a girl is born, they would call him, you told us, he didn't want to hurt you. Ask your neighbor, I told them the same day. He was never wrong. <laughs> they have been astrologers. I have also seen astrologers at work, farm leaders particularly. Farmist, farmist. Farm leader will look at your farm. Hmm. Oh, the hmm is very common with them. <laughs> because they give you time to speak. Then say, I see there has been a lot of incidents. You met a lot of people like that. Oh, yes, I you met people like that. So you say, Yes, I met. Yes, it's been very disturbing. Yes, I have a You speak out a lot of stuff without realizing that they are very careful listeners. Then they talk of other things and they will, else will be like this. Then they say, oh, I also notice that there have been people disturbing you like that. This promise knows everything. That's what you told him. <laughs> you forgot that you told him. So I've seen that also in action. I've actually seen that in action. But if the planetary positions can be read to occur at the same time as some of our events by karmic law, and is it possible that the planetary positions are also reflected on the palm? Yes, that is true. The same planetary positions that occur outside also occur on the palm. And I studied that. I studied Western palm history. Cairo's, Chairo, Cairo's book, whatever they call it. And several books from the East. In fact, a man, Dr. Kiani, he came from India. He had so many books, a library of about 1,000 books. And he moved from India, he worked in Southern California, and then he moved to a border, Tijuana, a place which is on the border with Mexico. And Tijuana is right, and he's moved there. He did a lot of work, spiritual work, a lot of books, karma, dharma, and many books he has written. And his own books, about nine books he wrote, plus all his library. He came to India, he met me, he said, I dedicate my library and my work to you. And he died. He left this instruction. The United States Embassy, the Mexican Embassy, they all gathered and they said, there are parcels, huge parcels have come for you. They were all delivered at my house. I had no place to put them. And I opened them. They, all the old clothes of the woman who was his secretary, frocks and something, and laundry and whatnot. I tried to put all those interviews away. Then I opened other boxes, books after book, and large number of books on astrology and palmistry and numerology and all that. I was on a vacation. I said, let me see what they say. That's when I studied them. So I studied these things only by chance because of the books he left. Now the books have been dedicated to a library in a place called Simla in India. It is a library of advanced studies. And they set up a separate section for Dr. Gyani's library. So, 
but I got a chance to see some of these books at that time. He also wrote a lot of books on spiritual teaching. But there, he refers to the palm reading to be akin to astrological charts. In the early 60s, I came as a student to this country. I, of course, I made one trip during one month that's given free before we can get our exams. I was coming for a study of MPA and MBA here in Harvard University. So that one month I traveled around and I was giving talks on great master's teachings. During that period, I remember that I was able to understand how these uh, the people here are looking at astrology for mystery. After that, they invited me. They invited me several times. I had no money to come. I said, very difficult to come there. I am a poor uh, government employee in India. Not possible to come. They, they said, we'll arrange for you. I said, I can't take anything free. That's part of my principle. No freebies for me, from anybody. So what we did, they would buy my ticket. I would see what the cost is. And I did farm reading. $30 a piece. All paying for the ticket. I would return all the money for the ticket. I became a farm reader. I became a farmist. That's when I farmed off a lot of people. I remember one of those sessions took place in Detroit. I'm becoming very personal, but you asked such a question. I was invited by a Thai doctor who was a satsangi and the representative of the current master at that time in Windsor, Canada. He invited me for dinner. And I was in Detroit, farm reading. Some astrologers came. American astrologers, two or three of them together. They said, does the palm have anything to do with the birth chart? I said, identical. They are the same. They said, if you bring a baby, infant, a newborn baby, or a little baby, a bunk hole, and bring the chart, then you, without seeing the chart, look at the palm, does the baby's palm have the same lines? Will you be able to read it? I said, sure. The lines, the basic lines are formed in the mother's womb. When the quickening takes place, in the fifth month of pregnancy, the baby clutches the hand. They are just being formed. That's when these lines develop. And it depends upon the problems of the child, which is working through his DNA molecules. Of course, science said that together, and I said, that's how these lines are created. And they are totally formed at the time of birth. We'll bring a baby. Let's see. So I remember in the evening of one day in Detroit, the same day I had to go to Canada for dinner, they brought the baby. And I saw the baby's palm. I could read every line. It was so clear. All the babies are clear lines. So I was able to read and give my reading based upon the planets, which are on the sides, and the palm, which is the center of the hand. And I gave my reading. You opened up the chart, it was identical. I became famous. <laughs> not, not as a spiritual teacher, as a pharmacist. <laughs> they sent messages all over to all their friends. A line of cars and people gathered outside. I was supposed to go to dinner. I called my doctor there. I said, sorry, there's a big line here. And how do I dare manage? They said, I have invited 50 people to see you here. You have to come. Say, what about these people, 50 people here? Bring them along. So there, I still remember a great caravan going into Canada. And they said, after dinner, you can do your work here. Okay, they all came. And I was doing palm reading till 4 in the morning in the house of the doctor. So the palmistry also, same way. These readings don't create life. They don't create the events of life. But they occur in such a form because, to think of it, when you have a destiny already preordained, that your destiny pralabd is made first before the beginning of the conception of the body. Before conception. The destiny of a person, the person is living still, walking about. The destiny for the next life is ready before conception when the body starts. Therefore, when the destiny is already there, it works according to science to the DNA molecule. 
according to astrology and palmistry, according to the growth of the body, and picks up these same things from the problem, from the destiny, which is being, whether you say DNA is creating it, or karma is creating it, whichever way you call it, look at it in every way, you will find that there are indications which are broadly very true. I made one big mistake in my palm reading experience. And that was in the day right sir. My aunt asked me, I understand you learned palm reading now. Tell me. She said, oh, I'll tell you. And I saw on the side I can see your children's. I can see your marriages and I can see your children's in small, small lines. So I'm sorry to tell you, one of your grown-up children is going to die by accident. What kind of palmist are you? I was cursed and I was criticized. Is this the policy you have learned to say you are going to die, your child is going to die? I was so rebuked, I had to go to that master and say, what are these people saying? He said, ignore them, you just smile, so what? He used the same, same two word mantra. When anything happens in life, if you want to get out of it, so what? <laughs> so he said, so what? Came back next year, the second eldest son died in avalanche while skiing. And although it proved that I was right as a farmist, I was wrong as a psychologist. I didn't understand that this is not a message to be conveyed because what happened? I caused grief to occur before it actually occurred. Maybe one can from karmic point of view say that was also supposed to happen, but it did not happen again in my life. So oh, I have been careful. I asked, do you want to know everything or do you only want to know the good things? Whenever I've done palm reading and they, they say, tell us good things. I'm very happy. Some say, tell us all. I tell them good things. <laughs> so this so this much about palm listening. I might also say that uh, I don't do any palm reading because I have not I paid for my tickets already, <laughs> and I have, I am not doing any more palm palm reading except that my rate has gone up from thirty dollars it went to hundred four hundred currently eight hundred. Why the rate so high? Because some people on their birthday, I give palm reading as a birthday gift and I raise the price to make it more valuable. <laughs> but no, the palm. Thank you. Shishwarji, yesterday you mentioned in your talk, God did not create us, we created God. Are you saying this is a concept the mind created? Is there simply a great nothingness? Can you say more, please? Yesterday, you mentioned in your talk, God did not create us, we created God. Yes, I did say that, because nobody has seen God. Nobody. For one simple reason. God, in my definition, is totality of consciousness, one, where nothing else exists except one God, everything is within it. If that is so, how can you see God? The only way you can know God is to be God. You can become God, have the same level of awareness of totality, and then you know what God is. But to say, I see God, continue the separation between you and God. And God does not have any separation. The separation is the illusion that has created the whole universe. Therefore, so long as we are separate, we cannot have any knowledge to say what is God, who is God. That is why we call other beings, other entities, other levels of beings who run these universes at different levels of consciousness, we call them gods. When we say, there is a god who created this universe, and we can go and our master prophets are sitting next to the god, you know what we are referring to? We are referring to the astral plane of consciousness run by a god the same God who is being called God, who is being called Allah, who is being called Ishwar Parmeshwar, he is the head of the astral plane and creates this universe and runs it. You can go and see him. You can go and sit at his feet. You can go and sit next to him. Who is he? In, in some scriptures, they call him Naranjan. Some call him by the names. Some call him God. 
So he's the creator. He's the creator of the physical and natural universe and runs this. And the ruler has God himself. And therefore, when you say God, meaning that, yes, you can see him. And if you want, you can worship him. You can get moons from him. You can pray to him. And he listens to all things. It's a function of the astral plane of consciousness where all heavens exist, where all hells exist, where all basic formula, the idea that creates this universe exists. You can go there and see that happening. He worship those people. People worship them. But if you say God is beyond space and time, beyond duality, beyond fear of opposite, that can't be that God. You can go further and go to an area where there is no idea, there is no universe, there is no matter, but where is the creative power that creates all these time and space and causal effect and karma, which is a causal plane of life. There is a God there too. Few people, not many, worship that God also. The one who worship the God on the astral plane think that is such Khan. They believe that's the heaven, that's the ultimate. Because they've gone nowhere. Master the teaching of that level. When they go to that level, they teach, they call that the such Khan also. I have gone through the master, I practice with that. So I know that when we say that can you see God, we're talking of these entities. And by the way, those entities are also a soul like our soul. They are the same soul that is a tree. The same soul in an insect, the same soul in the God. But when you go higher than that, into true spirituality, not in the level of the Ranjan or Brahm, the creators of the gods of the physical, astral, and causal planes, but you go beyond that into far Brahm, beyond Brahm, beyond the creator of these universes, beyond the mind, and you go there, there you find our own our own self, the soul, emerges and is part of God. Not God, part of God. When you go to true home, the soul merges in the totality and find it was always part of totality. That is the ultimate creator. Nobody can see. We have to become that to be able to know it. So that is why if you want total self-realization, a total self-realization takes to totality of consciousness, and takes you, makes you merge with one within which everything is happening. All that we see here is also happening within that. It was never separated, never broken up, never made into pieces. And when I say that you can't see God, I talk about that. You can't see God. Now, leaving that aside, people who have never even gone to the astral plane, they are talking of God here. People say, God spoke to me. Who speaks to us? We all know it. Our mind. Our mind creates God. Our mind can create any concept. Our mind can create anybody. Sometimes we make an image. Sometimes we don't even make an image. And hear a voice in our head. God told me, do this. I see people in Chicago standing on the street, telling all the passers-by, God is telling me, do this. God is telling me that. Nobody pays any attention. If they are prophets talking to God, everybody would stop there and kneel to them. Say, here are prophets have come here talking to God. I once, I was in a job once of a district magistrate. A district magistrate in India has magisterial duties. He also has duties to make sure that people don't go to jail for no crime of theirs. Because the prisons there have a section for convicted prisoners and some sections for non-convict, non-criminal convicts. Non-criminal convicts are those who are danger to society because they're crazy, they're mad, they can hurt people. So you can lock them up to prevent hurt to other people. But the police would sometimes misuse this power and lock up the enemies. And political people would use the police to lock up their opposition, saying he's crazy, put him in. So the district magistrate's job was to go and check from time to time if people are un un innocent people and not been locked up. And you can talk to them and check. So I would sometimes go and talk to the inmates behind the bar and whether they are normal, they are normal, they have been locked up. I would ask, why do you lock up? Are you a politician? Are you somebody related? So once I went to the prison and I was outside the bar and one man came very close to me on the other side. 
and he talked to the very wisely in a wise tone. He said, you think you are behind bars or am I behind bars? Actually, you are behind bars, not me. Because the bars prevent access to those who are free and those who are not free. You think you have confined me? No, I am free to do what I like. You are bound by the rules of government to follow them. You are bound. You are behind bars, not me. I said, what a wise statement from a guy, innocent guy sitting inside. I said, who told you this? He said, God told me. And he pointed out like this. God told me. There was another inmate. There, there are some ventilators there. And he had climbed up someone who was sitting there on top of the ventilator. And he said, God told me. That man shouted from the top. I never told him. Babaji, will you help with meditating? Yes, I will. <laughs> I regularly see a health practitioner who works with herbs, homeopathy, and rock flowers, but uses a pendulum to find out what is needed. Is this permissible? Do I accumulate karma by using his services? I regularly see a health practitioner who practices with herb, homeopathic, and back flowers but uses a pendulum to find out what is needed. Is this permissible? Do I accumulate karma by using his services? Karma is created by everything you do, not necessarily these. Anything we do with an intention to do it is karma. Anything that happens in your life without intention to do it is destiny product. That's karma being paid. It's very simple. People say, which is new karma, which is old karma? Old karma is where there's no intention, accidentally things are happening. Where you're born is problem. Accidents happen, problem. Things happen in your life automatically without your intention, problem. You intentionally think, deliberate, should I do it or not do it? There are choices, and then you decide, new karma. So anything you do with intention is new karma. Now I am feeling a little guilty because I use herbs and I use homeopathy. And the question says, it's part of the question, do I create karma? Yes, I do. Because intentionally administer remedies is karma. All actions are karma. I try to do it, keeping my master in mind. Karma, converting into meditation. When I learned this, it made my meditation very easy. You can see that. If you can do everything by remembering the master, if necessary, doing Sabaran with it, then become meditation. But the real part of the question is, he uses a pendulum to find out what you needed. That is his karma, not the person who is receiving the treatment. The person receiving the treatment is not using the pendulum. The person receiving treatment is using flowers, herbs, and homeopathic remedies made from flowers, herbs. So the person receiving is not creating any karma. The person using the pendulum, using his method of finding out, that's his karma. So does the pendulum give a good indication? I can tell you easy way to find out. If the pendulum swings and he gives a little powder, it works, pendulum is good. <laughs> Naturally. <laughs> There was a man I found, he said, I use a pendulum to cure asthma, asthmatic people who can't breathe properly. So, what he had was a little fire burning, like a sadhu, a mendicant. And he had a little fire burning in front of him, and they have a pendulum. And the man would come, I have any treatment, let me find out. And the would swing. Yes, I have. Pendulum has said, you take a little piece of that little ash, give him on his hand, take it like this. Breathing became normal. Then uh, this was remarkable. Now people began to say, I went to that man and I watched this show going on. I asked a doctor who was my neighbor, a medical doctor, I said, you think uh, that the, is the pendulum, is it a placebo effect, is it in the mind that's happening? 
And he said, no, become the very ash. Because he picks up his ash from the side. I said, okay, next time I'll say, give me some ash for myself. So I went and took my ash and took his doctor. He analyzed. A steroid prednisone. Allopathic medicine for asthma. He crushed it and put it next to the ash. And it gives immediate relief. Even if you take it from a chemist. And we hear so many thousands of people gave clinic to the pendulum. So I, I don't know how well the pendulum works, but I bet many people who say the pendulum guides our destinies. I said, I'm sorry. How would you, how is what guides your destiny? I said, my destiny is guided by my master. And when I can't decide what to do, I check with him. And he gives me an answer either inside or outside. And I have advised people that if you really have a question, ask your master. He will give you an answer directly inside. And if he is visible or his voice is seen and he gives an answer, check with Simran, which is a method to check if it is master or your mind speaking. That's a good safety, safeguard. Check with the Simran. If the answer is still there, that's your answer. If it is not there, it disappears. Or the image of the master disappears, it's your mind. So, or it may not be like that. You will be driving your car and a hoarding of another ad for something comes up. Three words of that is your answer. They are supposed to send by your master. Coincidences sometimes give us masters. So, following this method, which some of my friends say, following the clues. A friend of mine always calls it following the clues. So he got a clue and he got the answer. Following these clues, at least in the last 60 years of my life, or 55 years of my life, I have never had to make a decision. Decision is always made by this method. So try it out. It works. It's worked for me. I hope it will work for you. A few more. Here is Shwar. How can anybody love a master if you have never met him and her on this physical plane? How can anybody love master if you have never met him in this physical plane? You cannot. Simple answer. I mentioned the case of Kutmuddin. He is telling his son that only when a shape holds your hand, you have seen him, can you say he is your master. If you have not seen your master, he may be a perfectly master. You are obviously a list B, not this way. You have to not only see your master, not only have his actual darshan, have his drishti on you, have his initiation from him, then he's your master. If this is not true, maybe you got some blessing and those blessings will work out and one day in the future life you will become initiated by a master. Yerushwar, do you like to sing? What's your favorite song? I'm sorry, I can't sing. My throat is too bad. But my favorite song is Rudolph the Red Rose and Deer. <laughs> what do we do when we begin to experience higher realms of consciousness and meditation when we don't find the form of a master there to guide us? What do we do when we begin to experience higher realms of consciousness in meditation, but we don't find the form of the master there to guide us. So many times we get glimpses, glimpses of higher realms, which you haven't actually reached there. But sometimes these glimpses build our faith. Sometimes we have had these glimpses early on, and then we don't get it for a long time. And we say, what kind of progress am I making? I did see that, now I can't make a progress. These glimpses are only glimpses telling you what exists there. The actual journey is a sustained stay at those levels. Even when you see the radiant form of the master, even when you see the real form of the master inside, it appears and disappears for quite a while. And then it sustains for a while. Master not going anywhere. He's there. Our attention is still shaky. It's not easy to bring your attention fully at the third eye center and hold it there. And that is why these different experiences we have, which are glimpses of experiences. People have had glimpses 
without seeing the master even at the highest levels. Just one glimpse after another. And those glimpses are only building faith. There is something there. But the actual journeys take place when the master becomes definite and he says, let's go together. Which can take time. Sometimes a lifetime. Sometimes more than one lifetime. But even glimpses are a good element to create faith. Create that there is something in and it's worth going ahead, going trying. So glimpses are a good trigger for building faith and our effort to do something. Moreover, many of these experiences are in that part of the astral plane, which is an overlap with the physical plane. The astral plane has two areas. It's a pure astral plane where all the heavens exist. And an astral plane which overlaps the physical plane, which allows a disembodied spirit, even after death, to be in the sub-astral plane, the lower part, and be still be working in this very physical level. That means a person who is died can still be here, can still be moving around with us, and can still be trying to contact us, may still be attached to us, may still be not willing to go anywhere else. And that happens because of the overlap of the astral and the physical plane, the lower part of the astral plane. Many of these uh, uh, descriptions of the higher levels of consciousness, there are many sections of them, having different uh, aspects to them. In the astral plane, definitely, that which is an overlap here, this creates uh, experience of something that is here and in the astral. Many experiences in the early stages of meditation take place in that area. So you're able to have something seen here and something seen there. It is a normal thing. Only when you have a sustained experience after crossing at the third eye center, after crossing an inner sky, when you feel you are free to fly. The astral body is completely capable of flying anywhere. When you feel you are completely free to fly, and you may or may not see suns and moons and stars, sometimes you see them, sometimes you don't. Some people see a lot of stars, some people see single stars. But those are merely experiences that occur between here and the radiant form of the master. So radiant form of master appears later, although images of the master may come earlier. Since the master manifests himself in you at the time of initiation, he is available to you. You can talk to him from day one. But if you cannot see him, sometimes you can feel him. Sometimes by doing similar you can hear him. Sometimes in imagination, you can make an imaginative picture. I just talk to the master. He's still the master. If he sustains, if your imaginative picture can be sustained while doing similar, it is the master. So there are many ways to contact. These so, so many glimpses come like this. And that is why the ultimate journey with the master takes time. And that is when you have sustained the long-term experience every day, the master comes automatically. And every time you see him, once you start seeing him inside, you can also see him outside. Which is a great experience too. You see him in the morning inside, you are driving, sitting next to you. And sometimes you're flying in the astral sky, he's flying with you. Sometimes you have an experience of flying, master in the physical form. The same form you have seen him here. He's flying alongside with you, and you have a little chat with him. Best part of the spiritual path I found is there's a friend you can chat with, you can share things with. You can have such an experience of friendship you can't have on this planet Earth. I can tell you. And that is possible. The master manifests himself right in the time of initiation. One more. Master G, you mentioned once that the colors of the astral gifts we receive from Sally on the roof have a specific meaning. What are the meaning of some of these colors? You mentioned once that the colors of the astral gifts we receive from on the roof have a specific meaning. What is the meaning of some of these colors? The meanings are different for each person. There's no standard meaning. Each person gets a gift. How many of you had this experience of picking up a gift from the astral sky? How many of you found it had a meaning? Very good. Almost all of them. Now, each one has a different meaning. If I had more time, I would go into the details. But all I can say is that these astral gifts, first of all, you will see astral gifts in which there is no physical aspect. 
the effect of from the astral. So the astral stage, for example, what we call crystal, or crystalline object here, are very common. It's a very common substance in the astral experience. Many people receive those kind of crystalline experiences. Here we don't have those type of crystals, but we get them. In the astral plane, there are some colors, especially blue, violet, that range of colors, which are so deep, they are not here in our spectrum, in our rainbow. Those are picked up by people. In the astral plane, we can pick up objects which are glowing with light. So many of you picked up objects which are glowing with light. They don't occur here. In astral plane, you can pick up flowers which are illuminated and shed light and change colors. You can't see them. By the way, when we did an exercise yesterday of the flowers and the drink and the and and the uh, thing, did any of you see flowers changing colors? Yes, there you are. Did you see flowers having light in them? Yes. These are those are astral experiences. They're not physical. But sometimes you can be tied up because it's an overlap experience. That you can be tied up with physical objects also that come up and they also have a significance for you. Colors, the objects, they all have a significance according to your spiritual need of that moment. And that's how they come up. Which reminds me that would you also like to have those gifts today? Yes. Remind me in the afternoon. We'll back for lunch now. <laughs> <laughs>